Satan works with all his might to deceive by his false doctrines, his false religions. He builds lies upon lies that lead men away from the knowledge of the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And people follow this scheme of Satan totally unaware. They blindly trust their leaders, their pastors, their elders to teach them the truth about God. But their leaders, their pastors, their elders themselves were gradually and progressively taught deception also. Every man-made lie, tradition, theory, and doctrine that is not of God will be uprooted and done away with. Well, to start, I just want to say that I just am so blessed to be a part of this group, this family of intrepid truth seekers. Amen. We love the one true God. Amen. We love him. And we love Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, whom he sent. Amen. We're so greatly, greatly blessed to have each other to walk this narrow path he set before us, seeking the truth and the blessings and the life of our precious Lord. And it's our prayer that we will mature and go on in Him and glorify and honor His precious name. And I pray that each one of us and everyone that's hearing this will continue to grow closer to Him each day as we await His return. Have you ever noticed, though, that the longer that we journey from Noah's flood, or the longer we journey in time from the fire and brimstone of Sodom and Gomorrah destruction, the human population tends to forget the judgments that happened. And they forget the reason for the judgment. And the inhabitants of this earth today, this world, are just moving slowly and progressively back into darkness, blindly following the king of darkness, back into wickedness, back into lawlessness, toward the judgment that awaits them. Mm -hmm. But all the while, our Heavenly Father bids us to abide in Him. And in Psalms 27, which Jill just read a few minutes ago, it says, When you say, Seek my face, my heart says to you, Lord, I will seek. Now, some do take this bidding seriously. Others, the majority, do not. So, we witness the societal standards that develop progressively toward the way of darkness. We witness the indifference toward God growing in acceptance. So much of the world is deteriorating without most people recognizing what is causing the deterioration. It's a spiritual deterioration, as very few accept God's invitation to seek His face. Darkness overtakes the church as the members sleep instead of diligently seeking Him and His truth. Denominations move toward acceptance and worship of pagan gods and pagan traditions and man-made religions. Some denominations began teaching theories and doctrines that didn't even exist 200 years ago. Many just blindly swallow the deceiver's doctrines that are offered to them. For an example, have you ever studied how the doctrine of the rapture, how it was brought forth into this world? Have you studied the truth about the true Sabbath day, which is Saturday, the seventh day of the week, not Sunday, which is the first day of the week? Have you studied what really happens to people when they die? Over and over again, I hear people today 
very rarely do I hear them speak the truth, but maybe they haven't studied the truth. So over and over, when one of their friends or loved ones die, the thing I hear them say, tell me if you hear differently, they say, oh, he's in heaven now. He's with Jesus now. Over and over, so many are taught that they go straight to heaven when they die, if they're a believer, or they go straight to hell if they were not a believer. But the Word of God teaches that death is asleep with no conscience of time. It's a passage of time in which the dead do not know anything. They're sleeping. And it's plainly stated in the scripture, Jesus even spoke of it in John 11, verses 11 through 14, when he was talking of going and, and waking Lazarus from his sleep. He, it says, after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him. Those are the words of Jesus. Then his disciples said, well, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But they didn't understand he's both dead and sleeping. Do you notice that Jesus did not say, um, you guys wait right here by the tomb. I'm going to go up to heaven and I'm going to get Lazarus and I'm going to bring him back. He didn't say that. He said, I'm going to wake him up. The next event for believers after the closing of the eyes in the sleep of death is the second coming of Christ. Death means you close your eyes in sleep and you wake up to be with the Lord at his second coming, if you're a believer. And I have listed here some scriptures that further state this. So do we ever stop and ask, why do people believe the deceitful doctrines taught on so many subjects? Well, to answer this question, I'd like to read a quote from the book that's titled, The Ship That Makes It Through. You most likely, here's the quote, you most likely have heard the saying, tell a lie loud enough and people will believe it. It's variously attributed to Adolf Hitler, Vladimir Lenin, and Joseph Goebbels, among others. And that quotation expresses a powerful truth that applies in many situations. Throughout history, both political and religious leaders have taken advantage of this weakness of the human mind to accept as truth that which is repeated from mouth to mouth, from publication to publication, from newscaster to newscaster, even from pulpit to pulpit, especially when it comes from a trusted leader. Many feel it's their duty to repeat and to promote what they come to perceive as truth in order to help others understand and believe as they do. Thus, the lie originates with someone at the top, a leader, a person of influence. And in time, as it is repeated often and widely, it is picked up by many leadership trusting people and earnestly propagated throughout the ranks. The lie becomes deeply ingrained in people's thinking and belief system because most do not study for themselves to see if these things are true. No matter how frequently the lie speaks, the truth should readily dispel it. It has taken hold in many minds because people read or hear isolated quotes taken out of context. They don't open the Word of God with prayer and humility to study a statement in context, comparing it with all the other statements on the subject in order that the Lord, and not the arm of flesh, would teach them what is truth. The lie can come in by the interpretation of Scripture that's not found in the Word of God, 
or the lie can come in by an outright fabrication that is man-made or the enemy made and is also not found in the Word of God. Have you ever looked at the Ten Commandments as written in the Word of God in Exodus 20 and set them beside the man-made commandments of the Catholic Church? If you do, you will see that the Catholic Church has changed the Ten Commandments, even going so far as to leave out completely the Second Commandment. It is recognizable that the arm of flesh has worked to destroy the truth in God's Word. And as a result, they take men who don't study His Word on a spiritual journey that is not Bible-based. And unless you are diligent, you can and will be deceived. Hmm. Men, or the arm of flesh, have no authority to change the Ten Commandments or anything else in the Word of God. Amen. But we see that they have used their man-made power to change the day of worship from the seventh day of the week, Saturday, to worship on Sunday, the first day of the week. And they did this in order to worship the sun god. Here is a quote I took off of a Catholic website describing the Pope's man-made authority. The Pope was never given this authority by God. Never. The ruler of heaven and earth is God Almighty. He is the supreme authority over all men and over all of his creation. Not any man. Here's the quote I took off of a Catholic website. It explains the papal supremacy. It says, Papal supremacy is the doctrine of the Catholic Church that the Pope, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ, the visible source and foundation of the unity, both of the bishop and the whole company of the faithful, as a pastor of the entire Catholic Church, has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always execute unhindered. That, in brief, the Pope enjoys by divine institution, supreme, fully, immediate, and universal power in the care of the souls. This is all man-made authority. God has not given this man this authority. It's man-made authority. And these changes to the Ten Commandments are made by the arm of flesh in order to override the authority of the Most High, our Heavenly Father, and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, whom He sent. When I was researching the changes made by the Catholic Church to the Biblical Ten Commandments, I saw comments of people that were studying this topic also. It was pretty interesting. One such comment that I saw, this man wrote, I'm not making this up. There is a definite discrepancy between what is in the Bible and what is being taught by the Catholic Churches. I'm just trying to figure out why. Mm -hmm. Praise God, he was trying to figure out why. There's another comment made by someone who obviously was totally blinded to the fact that the Catholic Church has made these changes. And here's that comment. She or he wrote, They never changed the Ten Commandments. Christ's church would never disobey him. And then someone responded to that person and said, they did too. They even changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Y'all better wake up and come out of her. In Daniel 27, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, talking about the Pope, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws 
and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times in the dividing of time. We are warned in Revelation 18.4 to come out of the political and religious systems that are built upon lies. The system that develops as a result of people allowing themselves to be led by false leaders teaching false doctrines. Revelation 8.4 we read, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. The comment that I mentioned a moment ago where the man said, I'm not making this up. There is a definite discrepancy between what is in the Bible and what is being taught by the Catholic Church. I'm just trying to figure out why. This person was trying to figure out why they would change the Bible. Why would they make such drastic changes? Why lie? Well, the reason for the lies is that Satan uses these people and their lies and their systems of false worship to deceive and to hide the truth of the one true God and the eternal life they are truly seeking. We read in John 17, 3 of a prayer by Jesus and he was praying to his heavenly father and he was describing what eternal life is. This is what John 17, 3 says. Jesus was praying. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Satan works with all his might to deceive by his false doctrines, his false religions. He builds lies upon lies that lead men away from the knowledge of the one true God and His Son, Jesus Christ, whom He has sent. That is the answer to that man's question. I'm trying to figure out why they changed the words in the Bible. Because the words in the Bible lead us to truth. They lead us to the knowledge of the one true God and His only begotten Son, whom He sent, Jesus Christ. They don't want us to figure this out. So slowly, man-made traditions and doctrines develop. And it doesn't register with believers today that they are even being taught doctrines and theologies that weren't even taught in the Protestant churches 200 years ago. But the enemy silently and carefully makes his way into mainstream denominations, deceiving all whom he can with false religion. The deceptions do not only come from the Pope and the Catholic Church, though they lead the way. Much of this false religion has spilled over into the Protestant churches who don't have a watchman on the wall to make sure it's not happening. So much of this false religion comes into the Protestant churches and many of their beliefs today come from adopting Catholic theology. And people follow this scheme of Satan totally unaware. They blindly trust their leaders, their pastors, their elders to teach them the truth about God. But their leaders, their pastors, their elders themselves were gradually and progressively taught deception also. And then they just pass it along. Rarely does a man stop and read and study for himself to see all the truth that is written in the Word of God and watch as a watchman on the wall to carefully guard against such deception. Jesus warns in Matthew 24, 24, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Just like the inhabitants of Sodom were caught off guard, and just like in the days of Noah, 
the inhabitants of the world were busy with their daily plans of self-indulgence. They were too busy to love truth and seek God for the truth in His ways of His kingdom. They were totally indifferent to God in truth, and they were swept away by His judgment. Jesus also warns against false man-made traditions passed down by the elders. He warns against this one time in Mark 7, verses 1 through 13. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Jesus answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the traditions of men, the washings of pitchers and cups and many other such things. Jesus said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. And he also said, He who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father and mother, Whatever profit you may have received from me is a gift to God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father and mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. And many such things you do. This same incident was recorded in Matthew uh, chapter 15. And we're going to move over to Matthew because... Mark doesn't record what Jesus replies. At this time, when Jesus said this to the, uh, to the Pharisees, then the disciples came and said to him, Do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying that you just, you know, do you not know you offended the Pharisees when you said that? That they're hypocrites by their traditions? Do you know that, Jesus? Do you know they were offended? Of course they were offended. Verse 13, But Jesus answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. And what he meant by that was, Every man-made lie, tradition, theory, and doctrine that is not of God will be uprooted and done away with. Then Jesus continued, Let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. I don't know about you guys. I don't want to be the blind led by the blind. God's word is truth. Anyone that deviates from the word of God, the truth, and instead blindly follows the blind leaders who blindly follow the traditions and commandments made up by man will fall into a ditch. This is how Satan works. In the story of redemption, we read, Satan would convey the idea that by eating of the forbidden tree, Adam and Eve would receive a new and more noble kind of knowledge than they had hitherto attained. This has been Satan's special work with great success ever since his fall, to lead men to pry into the secrets of the Almighty 
and not to be satisfied with what God has revealed and not careful to obey that which he has commanded. Satan would lead them to disobey God's commands and then make them believe that they were entering a wonderful field of knowledge. This is purely supposition and a miserable deception. They fail to understand what God has revealed and disregard his explicit commandments and aspire after wisdom independent of God and seek to understand that which he has been pleased to withhold from mortals. They are elated with their ideas of progression and charmed with their own vain philosophy, but grope in midnight darkness relative to true knowledge. They are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. The tempter assured Eve that as soon as she ate of the fruit, she would receive a new and superior knowledge that would make her equal to God. This is the scheme of Satan, to take the truth of Almighty God and twist it. Then to spread his twisted words, proclaiming them as truth. And because men do not study for themselves to ensure they do not become deceived, they believe the lies and accept the lies of Satan for truth. Jesus said in John 8, 43 through 47, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you, do, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not from God. We've been warned about being complacent and about being led by blind leaders. And we have been warned of the judgment that will occur to those who fail to seek God and His truth, and not just to seek it and know it in your mind, but to follow it with every ounce of your heart. In Luke 17, verses 26 through 30, we read, So it will be also in the days of the Son of Man, they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Men are too busy with their passions and entertainment and self-indulgent ways. They don't take the time to study the Word of God to make sure they are not being deceived and following the ways of the enemy. They trust their leaders in ways they should not trust, believing there is no way my favorite denominational preacher would lead me astray. That's what that lady said in that one quote. There's no way the Church of Christ would do this. It's true. They believe their leaders that much. Even some of Lot's own children and loved ones who lived in Sodom, they were inhabitants in Sodom, they didn't believe Lot when he warned them of the destruction that was coming that very day. They, he instructed them, get out of Sodom with the guidance of heavenly angels. Likewise, there are very few today that will heed the warning of the approaching day of the Son of Man. In Jeremiah 6, verses 10 through 15, we read, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? 
Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. I will pour it out on the children outside and on the assembly of young men together. For even the husband shall be taken with the wife, the aged with him who is full of days. And their houses will be turned over to others, fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. Because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given over to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed, he's talking about the priest, have also healed the herd of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace when there is no peace? Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not ashamed at all, nor did they even know how to blush. They couldn't even blush at their abomination. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. In Prophets and Kings, we read, Those ministers who are men-pleasers, who cry, Peace, peace, when God has not spoken peace, might well humble their hearts before God, asking pardon for their insincerity and their lack of moral courage. It's not from love for their neighbor, neighbor that they smooth down the message entrusted to them, but because they are self-indulgent and ease-loving. True love seeks first the honor of God and the salvation of souls. People want to live fully established in the ways of the world. They love the world's entertainment. They love their festivals. They love their pagan holidays. They love the wealth of the world and all it can give to them. But they're deceived. And the false leaders teach them, oh, this is the way, this is the way to live. This works, you'll get to heaven. Instead, God desires to establish us fully in Him and His ways. And when we allow Him to establish us in Him and His ways, He grants us a contentment to be separate from the ways of the world. And it's a glorious contentment. But only He can give you that kind of contentment. Only He can grant it. Have you ever considered this? When people live ingrained in the evil deceptions of Satan and in the deceptions of his wicked ways, and they began to experience failures and pain, and they began to suffer. They've learned to expect to pray to God and that God will do miracles for me to get me out of this mess, to keep me from suffering this pain. They hear of the miracles that God did releasing the Hebrews from the Egyptian bondage, so they begin to pray for miracles from themselves to come out of their suffering in the bondage. God does do miracles to release his children from the bondage of darkness. In Exodus 8.1, we read, And the Lord spoke to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But please notice, God didn't just tell Moses, go tell Pharaoh, just let my people go. He said, let my people go that they may serve me. The release from the bondage of darkness is for the purpose of establishing you in God's ways, not just to be set free from that momentary destruction and pain and suffering you're experiencing 
so you can then go on to continue in your wicked ways so you can build a golden calf to God when he doesn't answer according to the box you put him in. He is answering when he sets you free. It's usually just not as you desire because you want to be able to continue walking in the ways of the evil one. Is that not just attempting to make God in your image? The, the deceitful ways of Satan have been implanted in all of our hearts and minds, and it becomes deeply ingrained in our thinking, in our traditions, and so many love it so much, but that's not God's ways. Most of the time, people just desire God's miracles when they are overwhelmed by destruction because destruction is the resulting fruit of living in the ways of the world. God is working patiently with great long suffering and forgiveness to establish each one of us in his ancient paths if we'll just do it. In Jeremiah 6, 16 through 20, we read, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they say, We will not walk in it. Also, I set watchmen over you saying, Listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they say, We will not listen. Therefore, hear you nations and know all congregation what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words nor my law, but rejected it. For what purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba and sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet to me. That's a pretty plain and profound warning. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, we read, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. In the great controversy, we read, Whatever is built upon the authority of man will be overthrown, but that which is founded upon the rock of God's immutable word shall stand forever. And to those who seek truth the intrepid truth seekers. Mm -hmm. God says this in Isaiah 40, verses 9 through 11. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountains. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will flee, feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. In Christ Object Lessons, we read, It is the darkness of misapprehension, which means misjudgment, of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing the knowledge of His character. It has been misunderstood and it has been misrepresented. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed a message illuminating in its influence and staying in its power. His character is to be made known. Those who wait for the bridegroom, the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of the character of God. God loves his children. He loves intrepid truth seekers. 
He loves the weak lambs of his flock, and he will gather them and keep them in his bosom. But he will not be misjudged by those who are indifferent to him and those who will not seek him and his truth. His truth cannot be invalidated. It cannot be twisted, and it cannot be interpreted just to suit self-indulgent in different ways. To end, in Isaiah 40, verses 25 through 30, To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number and calls them all by name? By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? Well, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God? The Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is he weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young man shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. The king is coming. Amen. The king is coming. Amen. Behold our Lord. It is time to wake up, and it's time to f- stop following the blind leaders and the masses into deep apostasy and wickedness. It's time to study to study the tree, truth, to seek Him, to seek His truth. Amen.